Hi, in this video, we're going to be, this series of videos, we're going to be working through a GCSE paper. Please do stop the video, have a go at each of the questions, then compare your solutions. Each of the videos is going to be about 20, 30 minutes or so. It should give you about an hour's worth of fairly focused revision. If you're not sure about anything, always add a comment. I'll come back to you and I'll look forward to seeing you inside the video. Okay, in the previous video we completed through to question number 14, so in this video we're going to start from 15 onwards. Okay, so question number 15 here is a triangle and a rectangle. The area of the rectangle is six times the area of the triangle. So what we're going to do first is we're going to find the area of the triangle. So the area of the triangle, um, some people write it as a half base times height, or you could write it as base times height divided by 2. Okay, so if we look at the triangle, we've got a base of 8, a height of 9, divided by 2, and that's going to give us a total of 36 centimetres squared, which is the area of the triangle. Okay, then it says the area of the rectangle is 6 times, so that's multiplied by 6. So if I multiply 36 times 6, the area of the rectangle is going to be equal to 36 times 6, which is going to be 216 centimetres squared. OK, so let's use that information then to find the width, which is what we're asked to do in the question. OK, so if we've got the area of the rectangle, is going to equal 216 and as you know the area is going to be the length times the height so in this particular case it's going to be 16 multiplied by the width or the height um, these terms are kind of interchangeable but if I divide through by 16 what I actually get then is the value of the width and I can calculate that in fairly different ways but for the purposes of this video um, I've worked that out as 13.5 is equal to the width, which would be the answer to this particular question. OK, let's move on then to question number 16. A very typical um, substitution type question. The thing to be careful of is you've got a negative 3 in there. So I tend to use brackets when I'm working through this. So I'm going to write the 1, which is the value of u in brackets, plus and then minus 3 in brackets, multiplied by a half, which is the value of t. And that allows me then when I remove the brackets to recognize that I've got a half times minus 3, which is going to be negative 1.5. I'm doing these in decimals just because it's a little bit easier for the video. OK, so that's going to give me a value of negative 0 0.5, which is the answer to this particular question. OK, let's move on then to question number 5. little bit wordy, and you just need to be very careful working through the, some of these questions to actually just take it a little bit at a time. So we've got five tins of soup. Uh, weigh 1,750 grams. So if five tins equals 1,750, then I can work out that one tin is going to equal 1,750 divided by 5. And again, you might want to do some short division or something like that for this type of question, but we're going to get 350 grams for one tin. OK, then it says four tins of soup and three packets of soup have a total weight of that. So we've got four tins plus three packs and that equals 1490. So what can we do with that? Well, we can work out that four tins is going to be four times 350 plus three packs is going to equal 1490. So just in calculation, then I've got 1400 plus three packs equals 1490. So if I divide, if I subtract 1400, it's going to give me the value of three packs. So three packs is going to equal 90. So therefore one pack 
of soup is going to equal 30 grams. So now I've got one pack is 30 grams and one tin is 350 grams. And then right at the top there it says work out the total weight of three tins of soup and two packets of soup. Okay, well that's fairly straightforward then. So we've got three tins plus two packs. Well, three tins is going to be three times 350 and two packs is going to be two times 30. And when I calculate all of that out, I'm going to get one, 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 zero, which is the answer to this particular question. That's uh, 1,110 grams in total. And that would be the answer. OK, let's move on then to question number eight. I'm going to aim for about 20 to 30 minutes on this particular video just to give you about an hour's worth of fairly focused revision. OK, so Bellina has a garden in the shape of a circle, uh, which has got a radius of 10. So we're looking there at working out estimates. OK, now this is a non-calculator paper, so I've got to make my life fairly easy. So what I'm going to say, 10 is all right for me. I can work with that. I haven't got any problem with that. However, 46 metres squared, well, I'm going to make that 50. And um, I need uh, a value for pi because I'm going to be working out the area. So what I'm going to say is that pi is equal to 3. Now we know it's 3.142 etc etc but 3 is good enough for this type of question. So therefore if I use the formula I've got area equals pi r squared and therefore I've got pi multiplied by 10 which is the radius squared which is 100 pi. Now don't forget I said that pi would be 3 so therefore my area is going to be 300 meters squared in area and then it says each box will cover of grass seed will cover 50 meters squared of garden so if each box is 50 meters squared then how many boxes well it's going to be 300 divided by 50 which is going to equal to 6 boxes of seed as an estimate. Now again very typically with these they want you to comment on whether this is an underestimate or an overestimate. Well it's actually an underestimate. Now the reason being is that um, I used a value of pi which is smaller than uh, 3, pi is actually larger than 3, it's 3.142 etc. Okay, and I rounded each box to 50, uh, each box to 50 meters squared. Now, don't forget I'm dividing, so therefore I'm rounding up, and therefore it means that my estimation is still going to be an underestimation. Okay, and other than that, that would be absolutely fine for that type of question. Okay, let's move on then to question number 19. So question number 19 is a fairly traditional solve an algebra equation. Well, we've got some brackets. We need to multiply out the brackets first. So I'm going to get 4 times x is 4x. 4 times minus 5 is minus 20 equals 18. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 20 to both sides. And don't forget, I need to get x on its own. But at the moment, I've got 4x, and that's perfectly fine because now I've got 4x equals 38. I can divide through by 4. And I'm going to get x equals 38 divided by 4 is 9.5. So 9.5 is the answer to part A. OK, let's have a look at the next one. So I've got uh, part B. I've got uh, some inequality there where it says T is greater than minus 3. Now you'll notice that it's an open crocodile uh, jaw there. So it doesn't include minus 3. However, it does include positive 2. So it does include because the way we would read this is T is greater than minus 3 and less than or equal to positive 2. Therefore, the possible values are going to be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 
1 and 2 and that would be the answer to 19b. Okay let's move on then to 20. Now again it is non-calculator so just be very careful with this one. Uh, he's going to get a 3% increase in the amount of money he's paid for his uh, monthly work I guess. Okay so the way I would do that is I'd say well 10% is going to be equal to 150 so therefore 1% must equal 15 so all I'm doing there is I'm just moving the decimal point I can move it one place to get 10% that gives me 150 and then two places to get 1% that gives me 15 so therefore 3% is going to be 15 multiplied by 3 which is 45 okay and therefore after the increase which is what I'm being asked to calculate is going to be £1,500 which is his baseline plus £45 which is going to equal £1,545 um, monthly pay. Okay hopefully that's okay for you again if you're not sure always please do add a comment below and I'll always come back to you. Let's move on then to question number 21 which is a scatter graph. Now every time I see a scatter graph I'm always going to be drawing in the line of best fit. Now I guess I'm going to have to do that but let's have a look at the first question which is one of the points is an outlier write down the coordinates of this point. Well the outlier is the one that doesn't fit in with the line of best fit. Okay now if we look at the graph itself it's actually going to be this point here and the coordinates of that particular point along the corridor 10 and up the stairs is going to be 19 so therefore the outlier would be 10 19. Okay and then for all the other points write down the type of correlation. So what we mean by that is is it a positive in other words does it go in the positive direction which it does or does it go in the negative direction. If you're not sure about any of these questions please do add a comment and um, I'll put you uh, a note of a playlist. Okay then it says um, this is part C. Now it's actually on the next page but I'm going to kind of read it out to you so that we can refer to the graph a little bit more. So if we go back to the graph it says on the same day in another British town the maximum temperature was 16.4 Estimate the number of hours of sunshine in the town that day. Okay, so if we actually look at our graph, well, 16.4 is actually going to be here. Just be very careful. This is actually 17. So each of these small squares is going to be 2. So 16.4 would be here. Now, again, it's going to be a little bit tricky on the graph, and I should have drawn my line of best fit something like about there. Okay, so I'm going to go along and then. Then I'm going to go down like oh this. Okay, that's fine. Hopefully this is okay for you. Get the idea that really what we need to do is figure out this value at the bottom here, which I would say is about uh, 12.6 hours of sunshine. So if I'm just going to scroll on to the actual question is going to be 12.6 hours. And there is a variation with this. Okay, then. Part D is a weatherman says temperatures are higher on days when there is more sunshine. Um, does the scatter graph support? Well, yes, it does support this. Um, so there's an increase in number of hours of sunshine equals a temperature increase and that's perfectly fine and you can see that clearly from the graph. Okay let's move on then to question number 22. So this is a fairly firm favorite really express 56 as a product of its prime factor. So what we're going to be doing here is using a factor tree to be able to calculate this out. So I've got 56. Now I would always divide through by 2 and then 3 and then 5. So I start with 2, that's going to give me 28. Do 2 again, and that's going to give me 14. 2 again. I can't now divide by um, 5. I can't divide by 3. 
Um, however, seven is a prime number, so therefore that's pretty much as far as I can go. So 56 is a product of its prime factor. It just basically means, product means multiply. So if I work out two times two times two times seven, I'm going to get the answer 56. Okay, we'll move on then to the final question on this particular uh, video, which is going to be question number 23. Again, fairly traditional type of non-calculator question. The thing to do with this is to completely ignore the decimal points. Now, I'm very aware people have different ways of multiplying. Some people use partitioning. I tend to use the more kind of traditional 546 times 43. So I'm ignoring the decimal point altogether. Um, that's going to give me 1638 when I multiply through by 3. And then I'm going to multiply through by the 40. So I put a 0 in the units column or the 1s column. Then I'm going to get 4, 8, 1 and 2. And when I add all of this up together, I'm going to get 2, 3, 4, seven eight as I'm sure you appreciate I'm just copying this I'm not actually calculating it just for the purposes of the video however what I've also got to note is that I've moved my decimal point once twice so therefore I need to move it once twice back again and put it there so the answer to the question is 234 point seven eight just a comment here always please try to make your decimal point really obvious it just makes it much easier to mark okay hope that's been useful for you and i'll look forward to seeing you in the next video where we're going to be starting with question number 24 and i think that will be the final video in the series